For those of you who don't know, I'm Professor Susan Marcusi. I'm the director of QB3 in Stanley Hall, which is where we are now. And I couldn't be more thrilled to be given the opportunity to welcome you all here to what I think is um, something you'll all remember as the beginning of a very important change here at Berkeley. Um, this event is uh, really co-sponsored, and that means very little except for uh, moral support and money um, from BSPA and uh, QB3. And it's the first, as you know, of, of something that's going to continue throughout the, the whole year. And I, I'm going to turn the mic over in a second, but I want to personally think that I think this is really valuable. And I know you're all here because you've chosen to be here. And I hope that this and the continuing peer support groups that you guys respect, that this is a safe environment. It's uh, be respectful that some people have, for rational or irrational reasons, chosen to let their advisor know they're here or not let their advisor know they're here. And I hope you uh, remember that and are respectful of that as you grow and, and learn and, and go through this process together. Um, so let's see. The other thing I want to tell you is uh, this series will only thrive if you guys really take ownership of it and to help uh, prepare it, help sustain it, and help make it what it is. And with that said, this was the brainchild of two postdocs here that are actually working QB3, Troy Leyenberger and Diane Weiner. And um, they've done a tremendous job. They've really put their heart and soul into making this work for everybody. Um, so I want to thank you on behalf of VSPA, I want to thank you on behalf of QB3, and thank you on behalf of everybody in this room for uh, doing this, and uh, so please. Um, Troy and Diane are postdocs, and that's their, uh, you know, their job, just like we all have jobs. So uh, they're doing this out of love, but they can't do it at this intensity for, for the whole year. So help them out to make sure this sustains. Um, and I think that's it. So I'm going to now turn the mic over to Troy, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Oh, one other thing at the end. If you do have questions, you need to um, let the speakers repeat them, because we're, this microphone is going to be okay. All right, welcome everybody. Um, this, is, this being the first lecture for Thriving in Science, I wanted to take uh, a quick minute just to try to motivate uh, what I'm hoping we're all here for and kind of what the, the goals here are. Um, so to begin with, uh, I'm hoping that we can uh, think together as an audience very quickly about uh, first, uh, what qualities and characteristics you think make a good scientist. So I'm hoping people can just shout out what sorts of Characteristic. Skepticism, okay. Curiosity. Curiosity. Patience. Patience. Persistence. Persistence. Okay, these are all great. So I'm sure these are the other ones that everyone was thinking about. <laughs> um, so things like creativity, motivation, passion, resilience, uh, a lot of these are kind of, I, I think, uh, I think most of us would kind of fall along these lines. So now, um, a topic most of us might not be too familiar with. Uh, what kinds of things make graduate school difficult? Failure. Think hard. <laughs> Failure. Okay. Sorry? Science. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on. Is that it? Okay. Social isolation, lack of communication. Yeah, so I, I think all of these are really good. So I just came up with some um, that I wanted to talk about. Um, so we're facing a completely new game with new rules. So all of us were, I mean, we're here because we were all eminently successful as undergraduates. We learned the formula for success. Uh, we knew how to take exams, take homework assignments, and get good grades. Um, but now you're in graduate school, and uh, it's research, and you're judged on things that... Uh, you know, are inherently mysterious and uh, you, you don't have the answer for. So we encounter failure quite a bit. Um, so that reconciling that, I think, is probably the first real challenge that I faced in graduate school. And I think a lot of people that I've talked to share that. Um, anxiety and stress. Suddenly there's a pressure to publish, which none of us had heard about as undergrads. I mean, this is a whole new world, really. So it's not surprising that we have some problems. 
Um, so graduate school being difficult on the one column and the things that make us good scientists on the other. The, the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, I've, the, the reason why we're, we're here is because the things that make graduate school difficult also make it difficult for us to be a good scientist. And the two are really interrelated. I mean, for example, I don't know how many people who are under stress and feeling anxiety are also really creative, motivated, and passionate to be here. Um, I, I think there is, at some point, a limiting factor. And for a lot of us, it's very difficult to move past that. So the goal here is really for us to try to combat the things that make graduate school difficult in the hopes of making us better scientists and really getting what we came here for, which is top quality training and to learn to be professional scientists. Um, put another way, our, what I would call our collective goal is to empower graduate students and postdocs to become more engaged, resilient, and creative scientists. Uh, and we're doing this by directly addressing the sometimes personal challenges that come with training in science. So um, everyone who registered here, we mentioned that there was a survey that we had put together. This was in collaboration with Kevin Eshelman, who's in the psychology department at San Francisco State. Um, and in this survey, we asked you a number of, of questions, and these questions we're hoping to monitor over time um, to really try to evaluate whether this is doing anything to improve the situation. So we only had less than half take the survey. I really encourage everybody to take it so that we really, this is what we're using as a metric to find out if we're going to continue to do this in the future. And we're hoping to really uh, step back and see how things are after a year. But a couple points that I wanted to mention that came from the survey that I think are worth sharing, um, because a, a lot of us apparently feel these things. Um, so first of all, the number of hours worked. Um, I don't know what people think everyone else is working, but this is what the data says. It's uh, 47 hours on average. Um, so if anyone here is under the delusion that y your colleagues are all working 100 hours a week and you're not, just know that that's not true. Um, 51 percent feel emotionally drained by their research, and 45 percent feel burned out. 40 percent often think about leaving graduate school or postdoc. 67 percent find it difficult to find a work-life balance, and some of us have thoughts of hurting ourselves. Um, and I, we've decided not to put the numbers up, but um, if that should, you should fall into that category. Uh, there are resources on the website, and you're welcome to contact any of the organizers in the future at any time. Um, but the point here is to say that this is, this is, this is really meant to normalize us. I mean, if, if you're feeling any of these things, you're not alone, and, and that's really what we're all here for, is to try to address these issues. Some of the positive things we saw in the survey so far anyways, 76% of us uh, feel emotionally supported by our graduate student and postdoctoral colleagues. Now, that was chosen overwhelmingly beyond um, mentor at uh, your department or other faculty. So this is really to say that your primary resource seems to be each other, and this is really forming the motivation of our peer support program. And lastly, again, by a three-quarters margin, um, I asked you what you think would make you a better scientist. Three-quarters of you said, if you weren't as stressed and if you had a better direction or idea for a direction of your career, you think you could be a better scientist. And the idea here is, is that we're going to help each other do that, to combat both of these issues. So how we're going to do this is uh, every month we're going to distribute an article. These articles will be from uh, a range of topics and a range of sources uh, from molecular cell to uh, Harvard Business Review. And they're going to cover a topic that we're going to set as the topic of the month. Uh, we have optional peer support groups, which you've had the option to enroll in, and many of you have. Uh, and we're asking that that happen every other week. Um, we, we will have peer group facilitators, which many of you have volunteered to do, um, who will essentially take a leadership role in the peer support groups. And finally, we have a monthly uh, forum like we have today, uh, where we'll bring in a speaker, and these speakers will be from a range of areas, in and outside of science, from ranging from economics to business to education, to talk about the theme of the month. And it's not just to raise awareness about these issues, but to provide us with solutions and strategies to combat them. And hopefully within your peer support groups, among yourselves, you can find ways to implement them together. And lastly, um, <clears throat> 
I just wanted to point out the registration for this program has been um, much better than what I had, I had thought when we initiated this. We had 194 register, 154, so almost 80% of you, volunteer, like of your own choice, decided you wanted to do peer support groups. I, I expected 10%, so this is really surprising to me, and I'm, I'm happy to see that. Um, and, and almost a th more than a third of you uh, volunteered to take the leadership role in your, in your peer, peer group. So um, we're really happy to see these numbers. And um, with that, um, this is to introduce our speaker today, Professor Judith Klinman. is a Chancellor's Professor, Guggenheim Fellow, and Miller Fellow at UC Berkeley. She grew up in Philadelphia and received her BA and a PhD in chemistry from the University of Pennsylvania. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the Weizmann Institute in Israel and spends 10 years uh, at the Institute for Cancer Research in Philadelphia, first as a postdoc and later as a staff member, staff scientist. She has been in the Department of Chemistry at UC Berkeley since 1978 and remarkably was the first female faculty not only in chemistry but in all of physical science and engineering at UC Berkeley. She's been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. She is currently a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a member of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And with that, um, I'm excited to present uh, her talk, Not Going It Alone, Professor Judith Glenman. Well, if I put this here, yeah. that's one for the, yeah. for the video, and can you hear me? This Santa. This is permanently attached. Um, okay? Fantastic. Well, this is actually quite daunting and a little nerve-wracking for me. I wasn't quite sure what this program was going to be. And Troy was pestering me for quite a while with a title. And when I finally gave him one, he said, that's great. So uh, bear with me. I think I have an interesting story to tell you. And um, mostly, though, I would like this to be an opportunity for some kind of mutual engagement. So please listen to what I have to say. Don't take it too seriously. But also, I, I hope there will be enough opportunity at the end to have lots of dialogue among us. So that's the goal here. Okay. So in putting this talk together, I thought I would tell you a little bit about myself and how I got here, and then uh, strategies and difficulties along the way. So here I am, uh, 1941. Not a very auspicious time to be born, really. It was right before uh, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. And um, it was a very different era from what any of you, with some exception in the audience, people who are my peers or somewhat older even. There aren't very many of you in the audience, I know that. But anyway, 41 is really a very long time ago. Now, I think what happened after uh, the Second World War was what people in America wanted was peace, time, stability, a good job. Um, nobody was thinking about science, let alone women in science. It was just unheard of. And so here I am with my sister. We are wearing skirts, not pants, even though we've gone out to play. It was a different time. But something happened, and it happened in 1957. And all of a sudden, Russia put a satellite into space, and the US caught fire. Now, really, this is the origin of the post-war climate of science that most of you are benefiting from today. All of a sudden, the government said, oh my god, we have to catch up, and uh, pour, started to pour a lot of money into science. Of course, uh, for me, at that time, I was excited by science. I thought I would be a ballerina. My heroine was not Marie Curie, but Anna Pavlova. You know, I was living in a bubble, really. But all of a sudden, there was uh, Sputnik, and I had a very, very good high school teacher. So this is 
critical. For those of you who really don't know what you want to do in the end, don't discard the possibility even of going into the K through 12 world and trying to improve education. I know in chemistry graduate students have been doing that on a volunteer basis for a number of years. This is really critical. Actually, that's what turned me around. I had a great teacher. And for some reason, all of a sudden, I was hooked. So it, it helps. Education and good teaching is really at the heart of a lot of where we influence the world. So let's go forward uh, many years. Uh, this is 2006. And this is the University of Pennsylvania. So Amy Gutman, who was actually trained by Shirley Tillman, president of Princeton, and then moved to the University of Pennsylvania to be president, um, and are very much aware of the importance of minorities and women in education, these are the people getting honorary degrees. And I just, so basically, I have three degrees from Penn, not just two. I have my undergraduate degree, my PhD, and I came back in 2006 for an honorary degree. So this is an interesting crowd of people. I was probably, um, you know, I would have hidden in the shadows, actually, but I, they, they had insisted on a picture. But I want to tell you some anecdotes here. Here's Steve Wynn, who basically built all of the great casinos in Las Vegas. He's there because he's going to give the UPenn a lot of money. Uh, this is Lawrence Klein. He's got uh, a Nobel laureate in he's a Nobel laureate in economics. All right. Uh, Shirley Jackson, president of Rensselaer University. Uh, Henry Gates. Do any of you know who Henry Gates Jr. is? Yes, he's the person who was arrested by trying to get into his own house in Cambridge because he's an African American and they thought he must be burgling the house. And he was subsequently, in, subsequently invited by Obama to come and have a beer and a hamburger, I think, on the White House lawn. And this made the New York Times. I think he's an amazing guy, having written, uh, he's at Harvard, and he's written about the experience of the African American in uh, the US. There's yours truly. I don't remember who he was, actually. And there's Jodie Foster. Now, OK. <laughs> Who was the commencement speaker? Jodie Foster. Who did the students care about? So at Penn, at graduation, they line up the people getting honorary degrees and the students march by. And there we are, sitting there, looking really like, what are we doing here? And the only person the students really cared about was Jodie Foster. Well, I know that none of you would fall into that category, but it was a very sobering experience in terms of values in society and how much we have to work to appreciate what really matters and to spread the word. Um, Shirley Jackson, who was sitting next to me, whispered, she said, he's a Nobel laureate, nobody cares, right? So we've chosen a world that is quite different from the Hollywood stereotype, and that's all really to our benefit, and, and really we have to be grateful that we've seen beyond the glitz and have chosen a career that offers what we heard in the introduction, tremendous creativity, passion, with some difficulties, of course. But we really are in a very privileged position, even if the undergraduates at Penn didn't quite see it that way. Okay. Now, um, I started out, I got my PhD back in the dark ages in 1966. These are some statistics. Uh, you see how many uh, doctoral degrees were awarded in science and engineering in 1966 to women? Here we go. And then uh, it was about 8% of the total. And then if we move even forward 10 years, we've doubled to about 16%. So a lot of my experience has been as a woman in science. And, and for the gentlemen in the audience, you'll have to bear with me along those lines as well, because I'm going to speak to this in a number of the aspects of my presentation today. But in fact, you can't say that I started out in a very sanguine time for women and minorities in particular in science, but it has changed and it continues to change, although we still have a long way to go. So legal history matters. And um, certainly the Brown versus the Board of Education 
Uh, I was a teenager at that point, and of course, this is a seminal decision uh, by the Supreme Court that separate education does not mean equal education. At that time, it was thought, okay, separate's all right as long as it's equal, but of course, that's not possible. So we've moved far beyond that. Uh, in 1964, there was um, a Title VII to the Civil Rights Act, and basically, this was supposed to bar dis uh, discrimination based on race or uh, beliefs or skin color. And actually, sex was added to the list of protective classes because they thought that by adding sex, it would fail to pass. <laughs> so it was never meant to eliminate sexual discrimination. But the really big change came in 1972. As I said, after the Second World War, the government was pouring huge amounts of money into science, and a lot of the science was being done at educational institutions like UC Berkeley. And what this title said was that if the money was going to keep on rolling in, there had to truly be equal opportunity. Now, I was talking with Nacho Tanoka, who's in the audience, uh, who's a member of the Department of Chemistry, and he reminded me that even though I wasn't there, that there was a faculty meeting around this time where the men in the department got together and said, we got to get a woman, we got to get a woman, which was, in fact, a very strange way of putting it. I'd never heard it in that context. But basically what they were saying is we need to hire a woman <laughs> to be a faculty member, not we need to get a woman. Okay. We needed to hire a woman. Here I am. Now, whatever possessed me, I will never know, but it, here I am. Okay. So in 1978, I'm the first woman. Now, look, would you look at that picture? There I am. It is a sea of largely, almost exclusively, white male faces, right? Now, I'm still standing in front of you, speaking to you. It wasn't that long ago. But this was the composition of Berkeley back then. And there I was. And by the way, I had just gotten divorced from my first husband. I was a single mother of two pre-adolescent boys. Yikes. <laughs> what do I do? What did I get myself into? I mean, I'm sure some of you think that, but I mean, this was a major yikes, right? Obviously, much too much to do in too little time. That was a big one. But isolation. Look at that picture. And I had moved from Philadelphia where I had family and friends and I really knew very few people. I was really in a pickle. Few peers and lack of peer groups. Now, obviously, it ended up well, but I have to say that in that first year, I really did question many times, what was I doing? And I think when you find yourself in a really hard situation, don't bail. I mean, it, things do work out, and, but it really is important, I think, to recognize what's lacking and try to go forward from there. OK. Now, the first thing I want to say is that I have had some pretty wonderful mentors, uh, pretty crazy at times. I worked as a postdoc with Erwin Rose at the Institute for Cancer Research. Um, and uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on the mechanism of the ATP-dependent breakdown of proteins in the ubiquitin pathway. Now, when I worked with Ernie, he was... Um, uh, so totally consumed by science that I'd never seen anything like it, really. In a way, it was off-putting. Uh, most of the people who worked for him after a while, especially technicians, ran out screaming and never came back. Okay, This is the kind of person he was. But underneath that, what I learned at his hand was a, a, a love for science and for rigor in science and for getting it right and asking a question that keeps you going. So I think as, sci as young scientists, this is probably the most important thing you need to have in your life. There are problems that come up, and we're trying to address some of them here. But you need that passion first. And I'm assuming that most, if, maybe not all of you, but certainly the majority of you have experienced that and are carrying that forward. So I feel really fortunate to have had him in my life. I still talk with him. 
um, from time to time, and he always uh, wants to talk science. In fact, one comment he made, I'm going to solve the origin of chirality and get another Nobel Prize. Now, I mean, that's kind of ridiculous, but it's still, I mean, I wouldn't say that to him, but it's just this passion for solving a really big problem was there. The other mentor was Mildred Cohn. Um, when I got divorced, she took me under her wing. Um, she it, it was a remar truly remarkable woman and uh, someone who I considered a friend uh, and colleague as the years went on. She often would come uh, out to California and stay with me and we would have long talks about life and also science until she was 92. I remember meeting her at an ASBMB meeting when she was in her 90s and I wanted to talk science and she looked at me and she said, no, I'm done with that. But it took her until she was 93 or 94. It was like, okay, I've, I've moved on, but I see you're still interested, but I'm not. It was very clear. That's how she was, extremely clear about everything. She worked with four Nobel laureates. Um, Yuri discovered deuterium. Uh, the Coreys, who discovered glycogen and glycogen breakdown. And Davinio, who uh, uh, demonstrated the role of sulfur metabolism in cells, cellular metabolism. She said to me, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Now, that's a very poignant statement. After she died, a lectureship was established in her name. Um, and it was not just her research accomplishments, which I want to mention briefly, but the spirit of who she was. She was the first woman member of the editorial board of JBC. She was the first president of the American Society of Biochemistry, as it was called then. And uh, she, had, uh, she had no time for women's things, I have to tell you. Uh, when this award was established, it was a question whether it should go to women or women and men equally. The decision was that it should go to both women and men. She grew up during the Depression. She had a hard time all her life, but she never considered uh, these issues in the context of women or men prob male problems. I just want to say to you that the uh, Nobel Prize that was given for the mechanism of ATP formation in oxidative phosphorylation, a lot of the background was established by Mildred, the methodology and the analysis of what was happening in the formation of ATP from ADP and PI. She did some phenomenal work. Anyway, so there is this new award. And I don't know if you, I have been given the award. It was actually, I just learned this, but you can see who got the first award, the Mildred Cohn Award, Jennifer Arum, Jennifer Downer of UC Berkeley. Okay, so mentors. Now, if you haven't decided who your mentors are, you need to do that. You need to cultivate your mentors. Your mentors will make an enormous difference in your life as you go forward. And these are people who can be your friends, is what I'm trying to say, not just the boss or someone who you need to report into. But cultivate these relationships. They're very important. The other area, of course, is family and friends. And uh, OK, so family is really important to me, and I expect to most people. I have a second husband. He's here. I have a son. Older son, younger son, a stepson, a stepdaughter, their spouses, and eight grandchildren now. So, you know, it's been the exponential growth as happens in population uh, density. But the fact is that this is a key issue. Family matters. How do you mix family and professional life? You know how demanding science is. You think because you're a graduate student or a postdoc that this is, these are the hardest years of your life and it will get easier. Actually, it gets busier. I don't know if harder is the right word, but more demands will be put on you as the years go by. And you also want to have, must have, a quality of life. And for most people, that includes family. So this is an issue that has received a lot of attention in a research and scholarship and also in the... Uh, local venue of Marion Mason, who was dean of the graduate school at the time that she conducted this study. And I think you need to just see 
what um, has resulted from this study because in the context of the women in the audience, this is, an, this is really a key point. What Marianne did with her colleagues, she took data from the National Science Foundation and also from all 10 UC campuses, and she asked the question, we have all these faculty, we have men and women faculty, uh, what's the distribution? Of course, we knew there were many more male faculty than women faculty, but what's the distribution of women versus men who are married with children and have tenure? And the thing that Marianne likes to point out is the size of the head. Well, we could call it the swelled head syndrome, I don't know. But uh, anyway, that's the part of the anatomy we're focusing on is the head. And you can see that the disproportionate size of the head for men with fa married with children who get tenure versus women married with children who get tenure. And the reason is it's really hard to be an academic and raise a family unless you plan well in advance. Now, of course, this is retrospective. What we need to do is look to the future, how to overcome this, uh, this enormous barrier. Now, what was the major barrier here? It really was number of hours needed in a day to both raise a family and to have the kind of academic career that's defined by the institution. And I think this is where change is needed, this idea of how to make it and also have a family and a strong personal life. And we're going to talk about this in a little more detail, but this was a rather sobering statistic and one that hopefully will change with time. Now, one thing that it was thought for a while was that, okay, if you want to raise a family, and especially for women, take time out, right? I don't, I'll get my PhD, maybe I'll postdoc, and then I'll take 10 years out, and I'll come back and I'll start all over again. This is from, what is the date, August 2013, 10 years out from a whole movement of people to get trained and then say, I'm going to step aside and have my family and come back. And it just doesn't work. I mean, essentially, in this article, many women were interviewed who were reflecting on how very difficult, if not impossible, it was to get back into the system. And in particular, in science, we have an, uh, a way of life that requires you really to hang in there and stay with it. I don't think this dropping out and then coming back is the way to do it. And some men may even think, oh, there are more men staying home and raising children. I can do this and come back. I don't think that's where we want to go. This is my favorite cartoon, and this is in heaven. This is Charles Schultz's version of heaven. All right. Some of you may have seen this before, but it's worth looking at. It's from the 1970s still. And uh, Sally is sitting in her sandbox, and she's saying to Howie, are you going to get married? And he says, yeah, sure, right? And he says, I want to be very successful, and i got to have a wife if you're going to be successful. All right. And she says, how come? And he says, when you're out making a name for yourself, your wife is at home, she'll clean the house, cook, and take care of the kids. And she says, a wife will do all that stuff. And he says, uh-huh, for free. And she says, really? And he says, sure. I can't, you know, it's a good deal. I can't wait to get mine. And she says, gee, maybe I should get one too, right? We all want a wife. And then he says, well, get a pretty one. They never get traffic tickets. So this is the world according to Charles Schultz in 1970. It, has it changed? Yeah and no, yeah and no. I was just recounting before I spoke uh, here that I had lectured in China on the role of women in science, and I got questions from the audience, from the men, who asked me, Repeatedly, who should they marry? Someone who would stay home and take care of the house and the family or someone who would be their intellectual equal. So it, that was really something to think about. Obviously, it's a different culture. But still, this issue has not gone away. We all need a wife, right? Yes, we need a wife. OK, so um, you look to your right and say, will you be my wife? <laughs> it's a problem. But what we need more than a wife, really, is some commitment, institutional commitment at the highest level to grapple with these issues. 
And this is uh, from 2005, it's a little old, but this is a plot of the percentage of women in the scientific workplace in different countries. Here's the US around here, at least in, in current day. Look what's at the top of the list. Would you have predicted Portugal would be at the top of the list? So what is going on here? If you look behind these statistics, what you see is government policies that ensure that people have the kind of support and leave when they are in the early stages of family formation that they can continue in the workplace, not drop out, not necessarily need a wife, but get the support. The US has a long, long way to go before that's going to be true here. But there are other countries that can lead the way. I know there is a lot written on uh, Sweden and the policies that they've instituted. Uh, I don't know, is Sweden on here? I don't think so. It'd probably be more in this range. Okay, so we have government policies not working very well. But what about UC? And UC is actually working to try to straighten things out. And just the fact that we have this seminar series is a testament to that. So there are many resources. And for example, how many of you are graduate students in the audience as opposed to postdocs? So quite a few of them. I had my first child when I was still a graduate student. I, I don't know that I would recommend that, but that's what happened. But it's, it is a choice, and many graduate students choose that. You have to be aware that UC wants to help you if that is your desire or that's the situation you find yourselves in. And there are all kinds of new programs. I'm sure you can find the appropriate website. But there are uh, childbirth accommodation. There's extra funding. There's Backup child care. There's child care reimbursements. These are new programs that are being instituted. And so UC is making the effort. Postdocs, there's a lot that you can find on your own by going to the various websites. Um, I didn't look into that as carefully as I did for the graduate students. Now, Marianne Mason uh, goes around and talks about her, her data and the need for family care policies. And what is interesting is for those of you who are going on from here who are postdocs and will be looking for your first job, possibly an academic job, you want to go armed with the information because you don't want to go somewhere that won't have some of the, or all of the policies that you see is now willing to offer to young faculty who are beginning family formation. And I, I don't know how many of you are ready to go on the job market, but make sure you read what is, in fact, available here. OK. Also, um, uh, this is not just for women. It's also for fathers, as well as new mothers. So if there's an anticipated birth of a new child, you should be asking for tenure clock extension. So think about family formation at each stage as you go along in your career and how to deal with it optimally. <coughs> And then, you know, really getting down and dirty. Here is uh, Christiane Nuslin Volhard, also a Nobel laureate. She took part of her money, she created a foundation, and look at what she's doing for women in science. And I assume now more and more for men that because of the shared responsibility of housekeeping and child rearing, hopefully anyway, she's giving money to hire help by a dishwasher or washing machine and of course, the issue of childcare over and over again. Now, this isolation, which to me uh, has been conquered at some level by family formation, but one of the uh, major factors I attribute my success to goes beyond that. It involves friends and how friends can come together and help each other. So I was fortunate when I moved to uh, California from Philadelphia, I met uh, Christine Guthrie, who is a faculty member over at UCSF. And through Christine, I was invited to join a group of, this is all women, but at the uh, initiation of this group, it was both men and women. For whatever reason, the men dropped out and the women continued. But this is a group of women, with the exception of one, who are scientists and who have met continuously every other week 
since 1980. That's 34 years. There are many of us who have received job offers outside of the Bay Area. We haven't gone. I mean, one of the reasons we've stayed is this group. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of the women, but there's a book written about us. It was published in Yale University Press. Has any of you seen this book or read it? A few of you. Yeah. <laughs> I think I did. I give it to you, Susan. I did. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the undergraduates, uh, uh, science students, live in a dorm on campus, and they've actually conducted a seminar around this book, and they've read it and spoken to various people. Okay. So. First of all, who are the people, and how in the world do we end up uh, being in each other's lives for such a long period of time? So here they are. Um, this is in front of the National Academy of Sciences. This is Albert Einstein. We're all kind of cuddled up with him. And this is at the time that Christine Guthrie and Carol Gross were inducted into the National Academy. So we went there as a group, and we supported each other. And basically, that was a highlight in our lives together. There have been many sad moments and tragedies as we've gone along. OK, Mimi is at UC Berkeley. Um, she uh, has had a great deal of money, uh, trouble getting enough money to do her research. She actually supported her research out of pocket. So this is where I'm talking about passion to do what you love. and to the point where you're actually paying for your own research. Uh, she has been elected a MacArthur Fellow, which was a good thing, because it finally gave her some money to support her research, and a member of the National Academy. Some of you may have taken classes, but of course, this is a little far afield for people in QB3. But have any of you taken classes with me? No. Suzanne uh, McKee followed her husband around. Her husband's a professor in physics. She was planning on becoming an accountant. She got into group. We said, no, you're not going to be an accountant. Uh, she finally found a job at Smith Kettlewell. She studies vision. And uh, she uh, <laughs> listened to Betty. She was around when Betty Friedan was speaking. And she refers to herself as the cusp generation. She expected to be a housewife or a mother and dabble in science. Instead, she's had a full life pursuing uh, her passion in science. That's Suzanne. Uh, Chris, Chris actually had a nervous breakdown when she was a, a junior faculty as an assistant professor at the time of tenure um, and uh, was hospitalized. And group was formed in order to rally around her and give her the support she needed. She's become an incredibly successful person in the RNA world. Um, and um, really is the heart and soul of a group on many levels. Carol, I mean, each person has a story. Each person has been through so much in their lives, a lot of joy and a lot of hardship. Hatch Echoes was Carol's husband. Hatch was in on the faculty here. She moved from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison to be with Hatch. She died, I think, two years later. She's now over at UCSF. And you know, had to pick herself up and move on and recreate her life here in the Bay Area. Ellen was a faculty member here in Stanley Hall, the old Stanley Hall, not the new Stanley Hall. She did not get tenure. She was devastated. Uh, she was in the department of, what was it called at that time? I think it was molecular biology. Um, she actually went into the biotech industry, but she's the author of the book about group. And she called it her Valentine group. And then we have, have uh, Helen, who was an administrative assistant here in Stanley Hall, and um, puts up with all of us scientists, actually, and has been a wonderful guide. She's the uh, eldest member of the group. OK, so what is group? How does group work? And why should you do it, too? Now, group uh, is not always easy. We are eight, strong-minded, and at times, um, curmudgeonly people. We have uh, our own points of view, but we love each other. We're, we're more like family. So having stayed together for such a long time has made a difference. But a lot of you are trans here. Who knows where you're going to end up? So I don't want to make longevity the reason to create a group, but I want to illustrate just what we do in group and why it's so useful. So 
We meet, it used to be every other Thursday, now it's every other Wednesday, but it doesn't matter. We meet in each other's houses, so we rotate around. We sit down and we ask for a block of time. So you think in advance, what is the thing that's troubling me the most in my life right now? Is it can be personal, it's often professional. And in the beginning, it was largely professional as we were all trying to make our way and it's segued into more personal concerns. But we, we take some time. We ask for time and we're supposed to keep to that time and we get feedback. And uh, usually that takes a couple hours, but the, at the end, the wine bottles are open, dinner is served, and we sit and we talk and laugh and have a very good time. So you can imagine we may wake up the next morning with a bit of a head hangover, but on the other hand, we have, in fact, created the community. We have created community of like-minded souls, and this is what it's about. So, for example, um, the book talks about the history. I don't want to give you a lot of that here. But I'd like you to just take a look at, at part two, which is called group work. So I think this issue of being entitled to success and appreciating who we are, it's a very, it may sound like, oh, is that a big deal, but it's not. Many, many people suffer from this sense of either you know, being in over their heads or not being entitled to all of the advances and perks that come along with a scientific career. So I think this is something all of us have worked on. Um, and then instinct, I remember my first graduate student telling her, well, what does your instinct say? And she looked at me like I was crazy. What do you mean my instinct? It's a science. It's not true. Instinct is very important. Time management, big issue. Um, let's see. Taking care of ourselves. Life is a limited resource. When you have a group of people who can remind you over and over again that you have to take care of yourself, it's an, it's not a minor point at all. Um, and how to be professional and still be emotional. <laughs> we don't have to be sticks. We really have rich emotional lives, each of us, and the question is how to integrate that into our professional lives. And I think uh, more and more that's accepted, but certainly when I was starting out, you know, if someone looked at you cross-eyed, you didn't start to cry. That was definitely a no-no. Okay. Now, um, yeah, how to work with other people, how to give talks, getting older, going home. And then this issue of pigs, contracts, and strokes. Over the years, each one of the members of the group has a huge collection of pigs. Piggy banks, plastic pigs, pottery pigs, pig pot holders, pig towels. Why? Because it, it was the idea that we are our worst enemy. Each of us can be our worst enemy. We call it pigging ourselves out. And the idea is to recognize that and to move into a place where you really see yourself as someone who is, is strong and has a tremendous opportunity in life to do what you want to do. I'm going to get back to this on the next slide because it's reemerged uh, in a recent editorial in Science about a month ago, the idea of pigging yourself out. So badly you get incapacitated, you can't work. Contracts, we get together, we're tough on each other, and we make sure that there's a contract that we will write down and follow, or at least attempt to follow, in terms of how to get under control what has been most difficult in the preceding weeks or months, and strokes. And then we tell each other what we really like about each other. And you, when someone does that, you have to keep your mouth shut. The tendency when someone says something nice to you is to say, oh, no, no, no. Well, you're not allowed to do that in group. You have to let it in and accept the strokes. So this idea of pigging yourself out. How many of you have never pigged yourself out about anything? <laughs> I, it, it's really, it, it it's just becomes a disability. So it was so interesting. This is, uh, what month? I think this was last month from the Working Life editorial. Are people reading this? It's in the back of Science, Science Magazine every week. And this is from a graduate student at Stanford. And the, the gist of it was, tell the negative committee to shut up, right? So he's got all this negative influence in his life. But in fact, 
The committee is no other than himself. It's called the imposter syndrome. We call it pigs. But this is such a real part of working in a high-powered environment. And I think just recognizing that everyone has it and that you really do have the opportunity and control to do away with the uh, imposter syndrome. And having friends and a peer group to do it with really makes a difference. And then one last thing, where do we go from here? Now, I am uh, very much an academic. I really believe in basic research. But the world is changing. And so I think that academia is not necessarily a default career for everyone. I think we need to do a better job of discussing the options here at UC Berkeley. And you know, talk to your PhD and postdoc advisor. This is the other thing about not isolating yourself too much but being willing to talk with the person who's training you about what alternatives there are, where your niche is in science. Not everyone has the same niche. And I think you want to keep that in mind because there's an enormous amount of pressure here. You know, it's a parent-child thing that you turn out to be like your parent, who's your PhD or postdoc advisor. So come out of the closet if you want to. But more than that, Talk about it. Talk to your peers about it. And talk to your advisor, your bosses. I'm done. Mary Ann Mason and I talked over the years, and I really appreciate the, the commitment she has taken in her life to understanding what goes on at the UC campuses. These are my assistants, my previous assistant, and Karen, who helped with the uh, slides and, of course, group, which has made it possible for me to give you an example, anyway, of a peer group and what it has meant in my life. So, and I thank you, and I've gone on much longer than I thought. Sorry about that. Yes, ma'am. How did you actually go about finding that group of people? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us, you know, we all, every, there's the busyness syndrome, right? Everyone thinks they're so busy. We all think we're just too busy to do these things. And how did you find people who were like minded then actually, I mean, you said it was for just one woman initially, but, but how did that happen? And how okay, so uh, the question is how did I go about finding a group? with some elaboration around it. But that's the basic question. First of all, there really weren't such groups when we started. Um, so first of all, it would never have occurred to me to have, have a group, start a group, be in a group. And it really was around this uh, nervous breakdown that one of the women had that was the nucleating force in the group. So that, for me, uh, is a very different situation from what you may face now. Mind you, I had been introduced to her by a friend and colleague from UPenn who had come to do a sabbatical year in her lab and was worried about Christine and worried about me being all alone. She thought we could commiserate with each other or help each other. And that's how it all came about for me. But I think that, in fact, um, there's a lot of history now with peer groups. At least there's a growing generation. When I visit different campuses, people have attempted to create their own peer group. So if you are particularly interested, then you could take the initiative. Someone has to take the initiative. You must have some friends that you chat with over lunch or just go for a walk with. I think starting with the casual suggestion that you would like to be in a group, give it a try. I think the procedures can be worked out relatively easily. It's finding the right mix of people. And I wouldn't necessarily keep it just to women. I would have women and men as well, if that's what suited you. You have to decide for yourself. But since you asked the question, you may be the right person to take the initiative and get it started. Yeah. I know you're busy. Everyone thinks they're too busy to do every, anything else. Someone was talking to me about a meditation group on campus. Yes, thank you. And um, meditation is the sort of thing you think I'm much too busy to meditate. Right? So you never sit down and meditate. But if you sit down and meditate, you realize that actually without the meditation, you never get anything done. 
I mean, it's, it's circular, but the meditation puts you in a quiet place where you can actually just prioritize in your life and get some quiet emotional stability that you can then move out into the world in a way that's not so overcome by the busyness of your life. So whether you're a graduate student or I, mean, I don't care what, what you're doing in life, our society is pulling for constant busyness. So you have to be able to step back and prioritize. If this is a priority, go for it, really. Now I know this group uh, peer group idea is central to this seminar series, and so there may be some help through you, Troy, right? I think you are facilitating the generation of groups and asking for people who want to join, and then what are you going to do? Are you going to actually mix and match people? How are you going to do that? Maybe Troy would be better to answer this. This is a very important question, so I'm going to give the mic to Troy. Uh, let's see, you need to talk into this, so too. I, I wasn't prepared to talk about this now, but... Um Basically, what wait, wait, hold on. This is oh, for the recording. Thank Just you. Just put it on. All right. So um, we collected registration information from everybody about your career stage, and uh, what we're doing is basically um, putting everybody into peer groups based on comparable career stages. So postdocs will be meeting postdocs, and um, we're we're keeping people from different labs separate so that there won't be anyone that um, you're working closely with. Um, and you know we're planning to send out the email uh, in in the next few weeks. We uh, the volunteers in the group who Diane was actually going to talk about this, but we're going to be um, we have a training session for how to lead a a, a peer support group that um, is being organized on the 16th. So that'll be announced in a little bit. Okay. So more questions, please. Now is the time. If people could stand up and ask me who they should marry, and certainly, I mean, without any <laughs> concern for what the rest of the audience was thinking, surely there must be some questions that you want to voice here. Okay. How, how did your group handle difficult situations? Did you look for external resources, or was it all just kind of based on your own personal experience? Or? That's a very important question. We're a leaderless group, and uh, we're, it's all women, and women generally like to please each other, so we try very hard to please each other, but we have definitely gotten into trouble. And uh, we've run into a few crises, and the major crisis of group, which I don't want or need to go into the details, we had to get a professional from the outside to come in and work with us. And that really got us through that terrible time and we've carried on since then and we really haven't needed it as we've we've grown to know each other better we can be more direct and also more careful with each other too but that's a if you're a leaderless group keep in mind that you may need some more professional help at some point but i don't recommend it being a a group that's led by someone it really should be generated from within the people in the group yeah. susan yeah. i have a question you have a peer support group of other generally scientists and you had your family, but how important or unimportant were having friends and people that you were close with outside of our sort of scientific community? Like the right, world. right. How to have friends in the world and not just, there is a bigger world than science and not just in science. Well, I'm married to a psychotherapist and I remember his saying, we were out, and he said, what is this DNA? Okay, so <laughs> he, ha he comes from a totally, I mean, I've tried to educate him since, but he comes from a totally different world. So that has helped me because, you know, his world is just so different from mine. But I think this is an issue, and I think that, I don't know, if you are interested in art, you know, take an art class, or... Um, I don't know, over the years I think of some of the things I've done that are outside of work, of course, you need the time for it. So that's, but this is an issue of prioritizing and taking the time. For some people it might be joining a community, or I'm Jewish, so maybe it could have been joining a synagogue, only we never did that. Um, but for some others that might be, or a church, or, uh, yeah. But yeah, you, I think it's important, otherwise your world does tend to shrink and get pretty confined, yeah. 
How, how have you done it, Susan? You seem to... Uh... Haven't. You haven't? Ah! <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Uh, well, your kids will call you up on anything where they see an opening, so you know. You have to let that be. Yes. Uh huh. Can you talk a bit about the pros and cons of having a life partner who is not in your field or in your field? Yeah, so my first husband was a scientist, and my second is a psychotherapist. They have their plus and minuses. Pluses and minuses. Um, I actually prefer the latter. That's because of who I am. My first husband and I were very competitive with each other. That was a no-no. Um, and uh, I like coming home and having other things that we discuss and a different set, set of values from the one I find at work. But I think that's a, per- that's a personal decision. Many of my friends are... Uh, partnered or married to uh, scientists, and it works really well for them. They have a large group of friends that they know mutually through their science. They travel together. Uh, you know, it, it's, but it's a hard one. It's really a question of how do you meet someone? Let's say you are single and you want to meet someone, and usually it's through your work, and therefore you naturally get selected for in terms of both people being somehow related to the sciences. That's what I've seen anyway over the years. But, yeah, that's like asking me, who should I marry? <laughs> yeah. Yes? In the yeah, yeah. How to get your wife. Yeah, how, no, but how should everyone who's in a married, in a, in a relationship, yeah. Okay, so the question is how do you raise children and have a career or how, could you, the, so I, I would like to get a little more specific if, I, if we can with this question. That's right. A great mom and a great scientist. And how in the world do you do that? And you make choices every day. You really do. But beyond that, uh, if you're lucky and you have enough income with two working people, you hire good people, you get good child care, you don't clean your own house, you get help with squalor, but you know. Um, I, I, think, I think you have to prioritize, and, I, uh, and it is the toughest question. But I'll give you my experience, which is that if I hadn't done what I wanted to do in science, I, re, you know, I had to do it. I really wanted to. I had to. I just loved the science, and I, I wanted to have a family. So I, I think back, and I forgive myself some of the things I didn't do for the children, because had I stayed home, and been a full-time homemaker, mother, I think the children would have been worse off because I would have compromised myself to such an extent. I think if you can bring home a positive attitude about what you're doing and spend quality time, but it is exhausting. I'm not going to argue with that. And one statistic I didn't really want to throw out because it is a depressing one is what Marianne Mason found in terms of the number of hours that women work who are raising families and are having academic careers, it, it really is a huge number. Actually, I've totally suppressed the total number of hours, but believe me, it's much more than a 47-hour work week. So there is that issue, but I think using your resources wisely, paying for help when you need it, and also not being afraid to take vacation time with family. You know, there is this pressure somehow in science. You have to be here all the time, which I think is not right. I think you really have to step back. You have to take time just to rest and uh, you know, refuel your creativity. And you can do that when you have a family, making sure you make that part of the family life too. But you can't micromanage your children and have a full-time science career. I mean, you have to be able to let go in, in areas that you choose. 
Does that help at all? I, I, it's the question. It's, you know, that's why I focus so much on this family formation and the problems. Men do help much more. I mean, there are many more examples of shared child care. And I think establishing that up front and also choosing the person you're going to raise children with carefully in that context is important. Also, you know, if you're lucky enough to live in a place where you have um, family around, of course, that, but that's a luxury most people don't have these days. Yeah. Can I Susan, that? yes. Because mm-hmm. uh-huh. I think maybe, wrong. I think maybe you were getting a little bit about what society expects and how you feel. So I just want to tell one vignette. Um, is um, My youngest daughter was at Disneyland on a, some school Girl Scout or whatever trip, and the parents, I think they were moms, but I'm not sure, were having a discussion as they were online, like you spend most of your time there, about how hard it is for these girls they are going to have to make a decision. Do they want a career or do they want to be a mom or whatever? And my daughter chirped in, my mom does both. And of course, when I first heard that story, I felt very empowered by that, but then the parents turned around and said to her, no, your mom pays someone to do some of it. And I was really horrified, and it took a social, like, I, I, you know, I took, like, I believed it at first. Like, I'm a bad parent in that way. And it was like, oh, this really upset me. And then my daughter, the next day, said to me, I don't understand what those moms do all day and how they feel so happy. Like, what, is, what keeps them interesting? And I suddenly realized that that social norm was not coming from the children, but from the other um, adults in the room. And I felt less stressed about it, is that I think this is a self-imposed thing. And as soon as I realized that it was a self-imposed guilt and that actually the children could, could care less, it, it made a difference to me, for whatever that's worth. Thank you. <laughs> Disneyland <laughs> rises to the moment. Yeah, more questions. Yes. I guess on that sort of um, line of discussion, how, what kind of strategies do you think can be done to deal with either societal or self-imposed guilt over whatever, not working, not being a good as much as you I'm, I, I'm Jewish. I mean, guilt is kind of, you know, uh, you just live with it. No, uh, seriously, but, I, I, you know, it's part of our culture, part, part of our lives. Um, I don't know, as you get older, you just get kind of weary of the whole thing and realize life is meant to be enjoyed and not to beat up on ourselves. And it is part of that pig Syndrome that we deal with in group all the time, which is blaming ourselves. You know, we, I know that each of us wants to do our best in each instance, and often we don't. And so it's just kind of moving on from that. Yeah, and forgiving yourself for when you've done things that, you know, instead of ruminating and ruminating, but okay, next moment, here we come, like that. Okay, so we're going to have beer and wine out. I'm going to do just a very short uh, administrative thing. All right, let but me give you this. This has to go to. But if you have any more questions, Judith will be out there so we, we can uh, continue the discussion. Um, just a, a few quick, quick things. Um, we have some new additions to the website. Um, so now there are... Uh, a few extra buttons, so if you do feel like you want to join a peer support group after hearing this talk, um, you can do that by, by the far, far button there. As well, you can give general feedback, and if you have any suggestions for topics that you'd like to cover, or if you have speakers that you'd like to recommend, you can also do that now, too. Um, we really, really, really need you to do the survey if we want to try and get some statistics. We'd like to really know if this is working, so please take the survey. And if you have friends who aren't going to do this, if you could just ask them to take the survey, we are going to have gift certificates that will be uh, auctioned off, so um, please try and, and take the survey. And so for the people who volunteered to be uh, the facilitators of the group, 
Uh, we're going to get some training, and this is uh, sponsored by the Graduate uh, Assembly and also by uh, CAPS. So um, they're being great, and they're only going to be working with our group specifically. So that training is going to be on the 16th. We'll, mail, we'll send out an email to everybody who's volunteered to be a facilitator, but um, just to get it on your schedule so if you uh, can make it. Our next talk is going to be with Professor Uri Allen, and it's uh, Love and Fear in the Lab, and that'll be at noon on October 7th, so he's going to be doing a Skype call from Israel, so um, this is going to be kind of a time juggle, so hopefully everybody can make it. And uh, in preparation for his talk, we're going to have our peer support groups uh, work through this paper, How to Choose a Good Scientific Problem. Um, so please uh, discuss that in your peer support group so that it can be used as a means to, as a discussion with URI. And finally, I uh, would like to thank all of the members who have helped to uh, put this program together. So Troy and myself, Adrian, Sahar, Sarah, Alex, Philip, Varsha, Anthony, Corey, Alyssa, and Michelle. So um, we're done with the seminar for itself. If you like beer and wine, there'll be a little uh, snacks too. Uh, it'll be right outside.